And we're live. Hello, everyone, for joining me tonight here in beautiful Whangarei. It's been a rainy week, it's been a stormy week, and I've spent most of the time resting in bed. Got a, short, a shoulder injury that just won't go away, so professional help is needed. And I'm going to sort that out soon. Kind of the weird thing about that is that um, you can, it will affect your brain and your mic. You know, I, I've been getting migraines. I've heard kind of like a annoying little instances so I've just spent time just relaxing and staying in bed and the good thing is it's raining and storming outside so you don't have to worry about doing much as what we used to usually do is walk around town talk to businesses and get prepared for what we're doing coming up in July so thank you for joining me tonight uh, I'm waiting upon my guest uh, Katrina Tipene uh, to finish off our uh, second part of our discussion we had last week uh, Sunday well this past Sunday I think it was uh, so uh, tonight, once she joins us, I don't want to uh, cut her out of the um, discussion and put some um, you know, pressure on her to talk about things that I'm not going to talk about, or I'll talk about before she gets here. But there's something I want to, uh, that came across this afternoon um, on my, um, one of the groups that I'm part of, which is uh, Kiwi Antics, which is a very large New Zealand uh, multi cultural site for Kiwis, right, uh, New Zealanders. Um, and so this came out and somebody posted this and it's from Planet B Media. It's got to do with police. And um, this is what they say. Um, and I kind of get the feel that it's uh, a mum who's writing this of a police officer or a uh, or someone who's a parent. And I think that sort of, sometimes we miss out on hearing parents of um, these um, these people, just like us who put on a, um, put on a uh, uniform, the blue uniform, or the black, wherever you are, and, um, you know, they serve our communities, and sometimes they're bad apples, and we know they are bad apples, and this has got to do without those bad apples. This is just got to do about the work itself, as a career, as a, as a social work, because one of the things a lot of people miss out on understanding, and I think a lot of police officers going in miss out on understand, it is a social work. You're working in society as a civil servant for the on the behalf of the civilians, right? Uh, and sometimes the civilians aren't that great. Excuse me, got a bag of um, Stephen King books that just been handed to me and it's at my foot. It's too close, excuse me. Right, and, the, the, and sometimes they go in and, uh, you know, with very, very, good intentions of caring about their communities, caring about who, who are there uh, in that community, whatever group there are, whatever ethnicity or whatever, but they are come out of that community to, because they think, I, I would love to help my community. And it's a social work. And the problem is that sometimes people, as well as the police officers themselves, see it as a negative thing, or they see the community as a negative thing. They think that everybody needs to be told what to do, a bit like politicians, you know, they think they know everything that, that the community needs, and so they put their hand up to do that. Now, but I've, I've got uh, um, friends, uh, I have, one of my friends that I went to school with is a police officer. I'm not sure if he's still around. It's been about, what, 25 odd years since, uh, maybe even 30 years since I've seen him. Uh, from Bay of Islands, uh, a Maori person, right? Very solid rugby player, uh, got into police off, uh, police um, service. And that is a service. I don't know why people keep calling it a force, because a force is exactly what it means, that you're there to exert your force upon others. But if you're a service, if you're a social worker, you're there to harmonize with the community and go, hey, uh, what is needed? How do we make it a better place? How do we get rid of the bad apples? Or how do we uh, help um, the community function better in a positive way that's of value, that's also of, um, that fills needs in the community, that gets, you know, puts people that need to be put away, away, and people that are in harm's way, out of harm's way, and people are in a lot of harm's way sometimes in our community. I mean, I was in harm's way uh, only a few months ago uh, because um, of a neighbor that was very belligerent. At first, I thought he was a racist, but turns out whenever he drank, he became very belligerent. All his uh, bigotry, and I don't mean racist things, all his bigotry and what he thinks about other people. It doesn't matter what ethnicity uh, you are, that's what he thought. He thought he, you know, he, his belief was that he's, you know, he's the best and and that and nothing he's nothing he can do is wrong 
And even though if everybody tells them that some of your things are wrong, it just doesn't. And those sort of people, you just can't help. And sometimes you just have to get the police involved and go, hey, you know, uh, I don't want to be in a violent altercation with someone like this. Please come and step in. And after, you know, after I realized I needed that help and I couldn't put up with them all, I said to the police, come in and help. And they did. And following the legal system, we're able to um, have a move out at the right time without any further altercations. And the thing is that, hey, he went and lived with a, a white person, as we say, a Pakia, whatever, right? And he was the same. So he wasn't a racist. He was just a belligerent, bigot person. And we get a lot of those in our society. Uh, people sometimes mis, mis um, understand or are misguided in who's a bigot and who's a racist. There's a difference between them. It's worth looking up and realizing the difference between a racist and a bigot. So with police officers, and another one is like um, a few years later, maybe about 15 years later, I went, I went to school with another person when I was studying for my theology degree, uh, a diploma, and he became a, um, a police officer as well. But he left after a few years because of the hardness of the work, the toughness and what he saw when he was stepping up to the door in domestic situations or coming up to crashes or coming up to where there's violence involved. And this is something that we, um, I want to read this um, here and, um, and to take in mind about this. Um, and I think um, when we start, um, like I said, all right, I don't like the bad apples and those bad apples need to be taken out of the, you know, out of the bin, as they say, rotten apples got to be taken out of the bin. But they're also human beings as well who are very, very good at their work and they're, they're there to serve the community. And I think one of the things that is missing in our community here in Whangarei is community police officers, like those officers that actually go on and walk the street. I've mentioned this about two years ago where I was, I was out in the middle of the night and for two hours I didn't see a police officer on the street. This is, a, this is a, like about 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, never saw one police officer on the street, on, in the city street in the middle. And I asked the gentleman who I was talking to, who was, who was a food vendor, and I said, you know, stood there. And then afterwards, I was talking to a social worker. And he was talking about all the social work. And I had about an hour conversation with him about what his work entails and how, um, why he chose to be working in Whangarei, which is the highest, Northland is one of the highest rates in teen suicide and also adult suicide as well. It's getting up there. Um, I don't know the numbers exactly, but I know from the 20 years of talking about it, oh, on and off, and even experiencing suicide myself, right? I, I'm not a angel, like I said last week, um, the other week uh, on the last stream, I'm not an angel. I, I've been through some difficult times. I've actually attempted to take my life quite a few times uh, because of situations that I hadn't dealt with. And this is the thing that we have to understand that each one of us is dealing with life's issues. And when the stresses hit us, sometimes we react in a very negative way, sometimes to each other, most of the time to ourselves and to usually to our families, to the closest ones. We always hurt the ones we love, as they say. So one thing, um, let's, let's get on with this uh, without further ado, right? So it goes here. It's not the police who, needed, who need to be retrained, it's the public. We have grown up into a mouthy, mobile, phone-wielding, vulgar, uncivil society with no personal responsibility and the attitude of, it's the other person's fault. You owe me. A society where children grow up with no uh, boundaries or knowledge or concern for civil society or personal responsibility. And I talked about that a lot in these streams because... I hadn't taken personal responsibility for my own actions and I um, for a few years and it, it really made me um, empty and it made me um, angry, it made me vengeful, it made me uh, disheartened and depressed, which is the worst thing because at the end of the day, when you don't have all you know goodness in your life, you become depressed. And, and if you don't have um, friends and if you're not, able to talk it out with people, if you're not able to spend time with people, that depression can leave you in a very dark path as we, um, you know, as we talked about last week with, you know, with teen suicide and even, as I mentioned before, an adult suicide. Let's not, let's not disregard the fact that adults commit suicide as well. We, uh, we've had that happen quite recently 
uh, over the past few months uh, where we think that they have everything going. Why? What's wrong? And this comes down to this connection, as um, Trins mentioned last week, that with with your community and with your land, with your um, with your family, and you know, and it goes on from there. All right. So, so when an officer says, "Put your hands up," then you put your hands up. Don't reach for something in your pocket, your lap, your seat. That's a that's plan there is plenty of reasons for a police officer to feel threatened, and this is something we don't realize that when you don't do what they say, they are legally right to act, and this is the weird thing that a lot of us I learned this after I, I had my first um, altercation as a uh, 14, 15 year old um, back in, in Bay of Islands uh, with the police officer because I didn't know my rights. And I didn't know what the rights of the police were. And afterwards, I did learn, you know, and those are some of them, that they are not allowed to arrest you without reading the Miranda, right? Without telling you why you are, where you're being arrested. They're not allowed to put their hands on you without having, you know, your permission to do so after they've read you their rights. Because once they've read the rights and you go, I understand, they go, okay, now I'm going to arrest you for what you have just told you. Right. And then they can. And after that, they must treat you well. All right. So we, we got to understand those sort of things. And I think um, uh, we have a lack of knowledge uh, for, to our own detriment about what the police is supposed to do, what the police service is supposed to do, not the police force, the police service, when their interaction with us and our interaction with that. So that, carrying on here. So going, once again, when the police, when a police officer says, put your hands up, then you put your hands up. Don't reach. This is on a good thing I'm talking about here, not about a bad altercation, right, where they're being, you know, behaving uh, negatively towards you, or they're being, uh, you know, they're trying to cause a situation. This is just a normal um, situation with a police officer who, who's just, you know, telling you to, um, <clears throat> what you need to do. So there's plenty of reasons for a police officer to feel threatened. There have been multiple assaults and abuses, um, sorry, ambushes on police officers lately. And I've seen that. I've watched the, uh, a police officer arresting someone else and someone comes up and clocks them on the back of the head and knocks them out. All right. So, you know, when you're in that situation, even if you're a normal person walking down the street, you, you know, you, you're sorting out something and somebody just comes in and knocks you out. What are you going to do? Right. How would you feel in that situation? How would your friends feel in that situation? They'll run to your aid to support you. So this is the sort of, um, you know, situations they face. So comply with um, requests from the police officer. Have your day in court. Don't mouth off or fight or refuse to comply. That escalates the situation. Now, this is just, a, like I said, it's a normal thing. You know, there's no bad things happening. He's just she, he, whatever, are just there to follow through without any of the other abuses that the bad apples are going to put in or have put in. So police officers are sons and daughters, fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters. They're black, white, brown, all colors, all ethnicities, all faiths, male and female. They are us. They see the worst side of humanity, the raped children, the bloody mangled bodies of traffic um, victims, the, and the bruised and battered victims of domestic violence, and homicide victims, body parts day after day. And this is the other thing, like I said, mentioned before, my other friend who um, left the police force, this is what he saw and it messed with him uh, to a point where he left. He decided, well, this is not what I want to see on a daily basis or a weekly basis. I don't want to see these mangled bodies. I don't want to see these body parts. I don't want to see these children abused. I don't want to see better women. And, um, and his soul couldn't take it, right? Um, and of course, that hardens you as well. Day after day, you become hard. And a lot of times we know that police officers end up in uh, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, and then that leads to domestic violence as well. And that not only that, that also ends up coming out in their work. After that, uh, that, um, that corruptness of their soul becomes of seeing these things, uh, criminal activities and abuses and domestic violence and body parts, all these horrible things you know, it corrupts their brain, it corrupts their heart. And if they don't know how to deal with it, if they don't get the counseling they personally need to deal with it, well, that is going to pour out on their work. And so um, they become real bad. Uh, and not all of them, of course not. 
there's always exceptions to to someone being a rotten apple in the bin. And so this is what happens. But then there are also those, mind you, who join the force or the service to be able to exert that upon others, that um, that violence they have in their heart, that corruptness they have in their soul, onto others. So they're able to do that. Uh, be with you soon, cats. So, um, so let me just finish this. So, in that, so because they are corrupted in their soul, they end up putting that ugliness and horribleness onto society. So that when they come to arrest someone, they go, "Well, you know what? Who gives it? You know." And so I'm going to deal this person out my anger, my frustration. Now, in finishing, right? So they go. Um, they have extensive. Extensive training, but they are human. When they when there are numerous attacks on them, they become hyper vigilant for a reason. They have be, they have become targets. When a police officer encounters any person, any person, whether at a traffic stop, a street confrontation, arrest, whatever, this situation is potential to become life threatening. You, Mister and Missus Miss Civilian, also have the responsibility of keeping the situation from getting out of control. Now, that's our part. All right, so we're going to talk about a lot of harsh, harsher things soon. So many, and this, finishing here, the last paragraph here, many law enforcement officers are veterans. They've been in service of, of to this nation most of their lives, whether this or whether on the battlefield or protecting us here at home. They're only they they are they're the only thing that stands between us and anarchy on the streets. If you want to protect your children, teach them to respect. Okay. So I understand that, and I understand what the, this person is saying. It feels like it's a parent or a mum who's saying it, and I think there's good points they make there. But you now we're going to talk about tonight about a bad apple, and also about how bad apples sometimes are allowed to continue being bad, and I think that's important to understand that. And, um, and going forward, hopefully, uh, Kat, you, um, let me bring Cat on. Good evening. Um, I think your volume's off there. Your mic, I can't hear your mic. Um, you say anything? Yep, it's on now. Can Let you... me just check my side. It's probably my side as usual. Here we go. Hello. Would you like to introduce yourself again, Kat? Uh, my name's Katrina Tepania. Um, I am the founder of the Cover Up Project. Uh, we do suicide prevention and awareness. I'm also a whānau support worker, and my role is Oranga Tamariki, um, working with families with children who are in care. Um, I'm also, um, by trade, I am a bar manager, events and project manager. Um, and my father is Hoi Pa Rudolph. Uh, who hails from the far north in a, a beautiful uh, centre of the universe named a uh, little place named Pauranga. And uh, my mother is Patricia Tepania, and she hails from the east coast over in Waihapa, which is a little little place um, over on the east coast of the uh, far north. That's my father's Terawa. That is his iwi. Um, is Nati Kahu. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you again for taking time to come back on and finish off our, um, our, korero, our discussion from last um, from the other day. And um, I appreciate that because I was just getting into what we're going to talk about tonight. <laughs> and I was like, no. And so I didn't want to carry on. So shut it down and we'll just come back and try again. So thank you again for joining us. Um, I'm not sure if you caught um, that um, what someone wrote about, um, and I think it was a quite clear uh, post about police work and a normal police work. And we're going to talk about tonight about when it doesn't become normal, when it becomes very weird, when um, when they act, uh, when someone in there, and, and, and these are the bad apples. And I think one thing I think a lot of people don't realize that there are bad apples in everything. Mm. And, and, and it's worse when then there's sort of this authority, which makes it even harder to um, think. Because when you go to school, 
uh, you get police officers come up and go, hey, this is my job. I'm here to look after you. This is my community. And then you see them in the weekends, you know, behaving badly. And then you go back to school. Hey, uh, teacher, I saw that police officer. Oh, no, no, no. That's their job. And you go, but, and they shut you down. You don't know if you get to explain. You go, well, this is what actually happened. And, you know, this is what actually happened. I saw my parent being punched or being hurt by the police officer when my parent was just trying to explain something. And I think the other side of the coin is, which I'm going to get into, is how do a, how does a parent then tell their child how do they how to behave when a police officer comes to them? And I and I and that always, I mean, I've had enough altercations with police officers to know that it can go nasty and it can go good and it can be just normal. Um, last time I think I, um, I had an altercation was when I, was, I almost got murdered. Uh, uh, some guy tried to take me out on the street and I tried to explain to them that, I, you know, this guy was trying to take me out on the street and they smelled alcohol in my breath and they thought, oh, you know, he's just drunk. You know, he's not making up. Oh, wow. And because I had no injuries, because I was, excuse me, and because I had no injuries that they could see, uh, you know, apart from a scratch on my ankle, because I was so fully clothed, because middle of winter, I had my hoodie, everything, so there was no bruises or anything that could show. It was disbelieved, and that really made me angry, because it was like, I nearly got murdered. You know, this guy was trying to kill me. And, um, you know, and, and now you're saying I'm not believed. And this is the thing which we're going to talk about tonight, about being not believed, because people, when you tell people about these situations, um, and you try to put your point through, they don't always say, oh, well, that's their job. You know, they, they're, supposed to, they're supposed to do that. You know, you're probably being a bad apple yourself. And I know you, I know you, Trent. You're very hyperactive and you could be, you know, going out of your way to make a big scuffle over nothing. And this is yeah. the reaction people can have against you and i think that's the same thing people can have against anybody when they come to the truth and uh and uh when you talk about victims because it's you know we want evidence and um and sometimes people you're the only one with with the evidence and people won't collaborate it sometimes because of the position they have and which is what we're going to talk about so i'm gonna let you um go ahead and talk about that um and explain um, to everybody what happened well, what one of, the, one of the things that I will say in terms, and, and this is something that I've been talking about um, just recently, um, and this is law, L-A-W, you are innocent until they can prove you guilty. So they, it is their job, if you have done something wrong or they are accusing you of breaking the law, L-A-W, you've done something, you've broken the law, so therefore, um, we're going to arrest you. And the procedures that they take from there is that they that you are in, a, in the court of law, they can prove you guilty. And that is a statement in itself. Because if the police were to understand fully what that means is that we are innocent until you, the police officer who is arresting you for breaking the law, they have to be able to prove that in a court of law. And so you are innocent until you are, until they can prove you guilty. Doesn't always work like that. It doesn't always work like that, but that is the process, the due process for breaking the law and for LAW and law. They have to prove that you are guilty, mm. you know, um, uh, innocent until they prove that you are guilty. So um, for me, the incident that happened with me happened 16 years ago. And although people might say, oh, you know, that was a long time ago, you know, come on, you, you should be getting over it by now. The reason why I brought it up again was uh, not only the brutality and the police brutality that's been highlighted now, mm. but for the simple fact that even though it was 16 years ago, it's happening. Mm. So really what that highlights is that nothing's really changed. 
if anything, the only thing that is now they're video recording it. Hmm. And now they are capturing what the police officers are doing. And so therefore, once we go to court, because it's all about the court. It's yep. not about what happens in the street and everything else. It's what happens afterwards when you go to court. That's where all the everything starts to become unraveled. All the statements against you, all the statements against them, who's lying? Because you you get some police officers mm. that we that will corroborate against you and lie under oath when they get to the court of law. And so what it comes down to is whether or not who the judge believes, you or them. And but now they are video recording, they have evidence to back up the stories of the people who are innocent. Okay, so um, for me, 16 years ago, me and my brother had left the nightclub. We went out and uh, we were walking down the road. There was a young boy that had been pulled over by the police. He was on a bike. A young Māori boy was doing nothing wrong, but the police pulled him over, was asking him 120 questions. Mm. Me and my brother walked past and we were giggling and laughing. Mm. And, you know, um, we, we made a comment. And the comment was, if the police. Mm. We mm. giggled and laughed and carried on walking. Well, that police car, when we got, we got about 50 metres up the road. And that police car did a U-turn and pulled us over. Pulled up beside us. They jumped out of the car and they were like, you know, well, what did you say? And we were saying, you know, oh, we didn't say anything. Oh, we didn't say nothing. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I heard what you said. I heard I heard what you said. And we are like, no, no, well, what did we say? But he never heard what we said because he couldn't repeat what we had said to him. But he right. knew we had said something because we were laughing and giggling, you know, and just being cheeky. Hmm. But we weren't hurting anyone. We didn't right. hurt anybody, you know. We didn't, sounds, we, didn't, we didn't break no laws. It sounds like they know? were... Where they didn't get enough what they wanted out of the kid, and they yeah. decide, well, you know what, we'll get, we'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll see what we can get. Two young Maori, two, you know, two young Maori, uh, two, um, mm. uh, male and female, you know, yeah, well, well, I'm going to get them because they were laughing, giggling. They said something, yeah. So um, they pulled over. They asked us 120 questions. Who are you? What's your names? You know, and we're all like, um, well, what are you for? Or, um, we want to know who you are and blah blah blah. Mm. Um, I was like, oh yeah, whatever, and I went to go walk away. But mm. my, they grabbed my brother, and they put him, they threw him up against the wall. My brother did absolutely nothing. Mm. And when I went to go turn and walk away, and then I spun around and seen they had tried to, um, they had grabbed my brother and threw him up against um, the wall. Um, I walked. I said to them, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? I did not touch them. Yeah. I did not put my hands on them. All I said to them was like, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? You know? And they, they were telling my brother, you're under arrest. You're under arrest. What mm. is he under arrest for? You know, what is he under arrest for? Oh, disorderly behavior. So giggling. But what, what, what were we doing? Mm. You know, like what were we do? We weren't doing anything, you know, like what, well, why? And they, they arrested him. And then I was like, oh, you know, this isn't right. You know, he didn't do anything wrong. Well, the police officer spun around and he said to me, uh, F off, you mm. know. He, he told me, you know, F off, otherwise you're going to. And I said to him, you know, you can't, you, you can't do this. this is, you know, this isn't, you guys are all shit, you know, da, 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 da. You guys can't do this. I didn't swear excessively. I didn't threaten them or anything but I I turned around and I was just like walked away and we, as I walked away I said if the police mm. I walked away while I was doing that when I walked away another police car had come 
because when they arrested my brother and I was standing there giving them a hard time, one of the police officers had run through for a backup mm. car. Mm. And so the police station adjacent to where we were was about 500 metres away from where we were. So two toots in that car was there. And um, so about more, it would have lasted about five minutes asking them why they're arresting him, what do you, you know, you guys can't do that. About five minutes. So that's all it took for that car to get to where we were. And so I had started walking away and I walked about 10 metres away from where they were arresting my brother. I was just like, oh, you know, this is bullshit. Started mm. walking away and the police car that had um, been called pulled up beside me, done a U-turn, pulled up beside me, and this police officer got out. Uh, the police officer was about six foot, seven foot tall. He was huge, and, and I'm only little. I'm only five four, five two, five four. Mm. and this police officer was six foot, seven foot tall. He was huge, and he, he gets out and he grabs me. You know, he doesn't tell me I'm under arrest or anything. He grabs me and then he's like, hey, come with me. And he, and he, he signaled up to the other cop that had called through to him and said to him, is this, you know, this girl here, is, is this the one here? And he goes, yes, take her. And he goes, what for? He goes, uh, what for? And he goes, yep, take her, obstruction. Okay, hold on there for a minute. When I heard that when you were on the um, when you did the live stream, uh, I was thinking like a guy arrives on a scene, not told what he's what it's what's is happening, what he's supposed no. to do, no, no. clue, puts no. hands on you, gets out of the car, puts hands on you, straight away, and then looks over and goes, um, you know, you're under strain, and you're what what for? You 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 know, legally under the law. Asking, hey, mm. why is someone? Why is a male of all things mm. putting a hand on me? And he's huge, and then he doesn't know why he's arresting you, and he's telling you he's, mm. you're arresting, being arrested. And then he's got to look over to the other guy who's being an A, and asking him what for. And he doesn't tell him. He just says arrest him. That's the one. Arrest him. Yeah. It's like yeah. so. There's, yeah. That's all true. there's broken laws here right away. Mm. And, no he was like, and he was. And he was trying to grab me, and, and at the same time, I was sort of pushing his hands away and, and walking backwards, like, you know, I've done nothing wrong. And and he was like, you're, you're, you're coming with me, you know, trying to grab me, you know, and I was just like, for what? And um, the, the guy was like, yep, obstruction. And then he's like, that's when he said, you're a arrest. <laughs> and then I, I was sort of pushing him off at the same time he was trying to grab me. And then I went, I didn't run or sprint or anything. I just went to go turn to walk away to say to him, I've done nothing wrong. I'm out of here. Spun yeah. around, went to go walk away. And then that's when he grabbed me by my hair. And we mm. were, we'd gotten about 10 metres away from where the car was originally. I was walking at the same time I was talking. And so we got 10 metres away from where the I was put out. Mm. And so when I turned to walk away, saying that I've done nothing wrong, I'm, I'm out of here, he mm. grabbed me by my hair and he yanked me back and literally dragged me back to the car. Now, once I got back up to my feet, because he came from behind, I didn't see who it was. I knew it mm. was him. Mm. Uh, when when I got managed to get up on my feet, because he dragged me off my feet, from behind, dragged me off my feet. I I managed when we got back to the car. I managed to get to my feet and stand up, and then that's when I started to get into it. Yeah. And we we got we got physical. You know that that's when I felt like I was. There's, I um, started to defend myself. There's a lot people can't understand in that situation when you're being dragged off your feet. I mean, I've had that happen to me, and if yeah. you're so vulnerable, you yeah. you um. You know, I mean, I got dragged into a dark corner uh, across the street, and the vulnerable, you f so vulnerable you feel. No, nope, you can't understand it until you're in that situation where you have no power. I mean, the guy that you did that to no me was yeah, he was yeah. like huge to me, and he so you huge, yeah. 
and you can't control and you're like, you know, like I said, you're a small person. I'm a small person. I'm not, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not short, but I'm very skinny. And, um, and, if, and you feel so you have no control. And unless you're in that situation, people won't be under, able to understand. And, uh, and, uh, but it gets worse, right? For you, it gets worse yeah. here. Yeah, and so um, my initial reaction was to um, defend myself. And yeah. so we ended up getting into a really rough scuffle between each other. And mm. <clears throat> um, the there was another police officer with, that was the young oldie guy. He, yeah. he was probably a little bit taller than me, but mm -hmm. that police officer did absolutely nothing. Yep. He he didn't intervene. He didn't. He he just stood there. And then when the when we started to scuffle, the um, police officer, the that tall police officer, he he wasn't even from here. Right. He was. He had a Pommy accent. Yeah. He he was from. He was a British. He was from. He. He was fresh out of college, I could guarantee you that. Mm. Just the way that he was acting and, you know, um, just every, everything about him um, made me believe that he was an amateur, you know, fresh out of college. So was this other Māori boy who just stood there and just watched. And then it wasn't until the, um, the tall police officer was having trouble that he said to the other police officer, grab her, grab her. You know, and I think the Māori police officer knew he had done something wrong, that it wasn't right what that guy had done to me. Yeah. Because he never once intervened until the police officer had got me into a hold and he said, um, put the handcuffs on her, put the handcuffs on her. Mm. And then that's when he put the handcuffs on me and then um, he held me. Once, as soon as the handcuffs were put on me, I was defenceless. Yeah, there was nothing. There was nothing I could do, and so yeah. um, the Maori police officer held me with my hands behind my back, mm. and um, the other police officer ran around to the back of the car, jumped in, and was going push her. You know, get her in, put, pass her here. You know, push her, get her in, get her in. Well, this is the and white then, guy that's um, telling the other. Um, the British guy's telling yeah, the other that guy. Was telling the, the Maori guy, you know, and the Maori yeah. guy was the only one that talked to me. He said to yeah. me, just just get in yeah you know don't resist don't resist just get in you know and i was and i was livid by then and yeah. i i did i booted him you know i yeah. i do i owned up to that yeah okay yeah. I, I, when i when he was pushing me in the car i was booting him telling him get get away from get away from me yeah. you know and the other guy pulled me um by my hair into the back of the car and put me into a headlock Hmm. Once, once that was done, I got I got to a point where I knew there was nothing more that I could do. Yeah, that I was helpless. Yeah, I could not defend myself, and so I stopped. I stopped like trying to wriggle away or trying to get away, and you know, stopped resisting, as they would hmm. say. You know, I had calmed down, and I got to a point where I realized there was nothing more that I could do. Yeah. And so I stopped. But this guy had me in the head. He was he was he was also livid. The guy that was uh, the police officer that was in the back had me in the headlock. He was angry by now. I, I kind was, of you um, know when I was listening to you, um, that earlier in this one now I was I was wondering did this person come from somewhere in England where he was part of some group. You know what I mean? He chose specifically to come to a place that had multi, you know, a bicultural setting. And this is what was going in my head. I was like, of course, everywhere is like that now. But mm. specifically, mm. sometimes you kind of, you know, when, you, when you're making decisions to uh, leave, to go somewhere, you you take in count of everything. Like when I moved to South Island to study, I was like, where, where can I get a job? Okay, which church group I could join or which um, area? What do they offer me? And you kind of tick away at the boxes. 
And I wonder if yeah. he had a, if he got one of those boxes he could tick away and say, ah, oh, <laughs> there's some brown people there. I could, you know, yeah. put these brownies into he, lines. He, he definitely had a bee under his bonnet for me, put it that way. You know, by, mm. by the... By the end of the night, yeah, he he was just not having a bar of bar of it with me, but and it was the words that he chose to use, yeah. which makes me think that what you just said—that's what is made me very think much that. like that. Because, because people those, that are yeah. in those groups that that they go into those chat rooms that mm. um you know that talk like that—that's what they call us. Black yeah. monkeys. They call yeah. us monkeys, and you know, um, because if you have a look at a Homo sapiens, we all come from monkeys, and ra ra ra. Well, that's what they, that's what they look at us as. Yeah. You know, as monkeys. And so when when he said that, that that's very much exactly why I said, you know, um, in my eyes, he was a racist cop. Yeah. Not a racist white person. He was a racist cop. Yeah. You know, um, and just some of the other things that he was calling me, you know, like a black monkey and a black black bee, I-T-C-H, yeah. you know. Um, and and then when when the the thing that really got me was when we got back to the um, station, mm. what he said to me before – we got out of the car, you, you know. That was the one that really made me think, oh, I'm, I'm going to get you, you know. Yeah. I didn't know how, yeah. but I, I knew I was going to get him for what he had done to me. Not not like I'm going to get you and take you out. I'm going yeah. to make sure that you don't get away with this. Right. And um, was when he said to me that he was going to take me into the cells and he was going to run a train on me. Hold on for a second, because I want to really discuss this in de detail, um, what runner train is, because I know what it is, and I've heard it many, you know, I've heard it enough times to know what it is, uh, especially uh, on females. So the fact that he says to a female, I mean, it, it ha happens to males as well, but we're talking, yeah. you know, when it comes to females here, uh, basically it's, it's one of the most horrid. It's most one of the it's horrible things. It's a gang slang. It's yeah. a gang slang. Yeah. Or um, uh, uh, where they have one person come in and um, rape you, then the next one will come in and rape you, and the next one, the next one. And that is what they, that's what they call a train. Yeah. But if you remember, I'm not too sure if you will remember, but um, probably a, a bit more than 16 years, maybe about 18 years ago, there was that young girl that was taken into the police station and she that's what happened to her. Mm. Uh, I think it was in Auckland. Um, she was taken into the cells and the police had run a train on her. Um, it was like a really, really well-known commander and a couple of other constables that had gone in and sexually abused this girl. But then yeah. what had happened was they had drugged her. They They had drugged her. So when she went to court... There were a lot of parts in it that she couldn't really remember. Yeah. And so um, it almost never held up in court. Yeah. Until one of them broke. Yeah. What well, one of them were like, <clears throat> I'm, oh, you know, like I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to. And then that's when the he dropped the rest of them in it. Yeah. And this is a and thing. That was about that eighteen years ago. You only need one good person to fix, well, bring yeah. to light the badness. And a lot of times, yeah. you know, um, we used to, because I lived in Auckland, as I mentioned last time, uh, for almost four or five years, and we had a we had a saying about brown cops, cameo creams, right? <laughs> you're brown on the outside, yeah. <laughs> but you're white on the inside because of the racism yeah. and the force. Yeah. And this is like about 89 89 to uh, 91 uh, that I think, or oh, 92 that I lived in Auckland. Might have been, yeah, around that time. So we already, as, a, as youth, understood what a cameo cream was and what, what it meant yeah. to be a racist brown cop. 
don't, don't matter, you know, what, um, you know, what you had, but inside you still were racist to your, maybe to your own kind, to others. Didn't have to be a, a brown person that you're racist to. Could have been to a white kid you were racist to. Because I ran with everybody. Uh, my group was, you know, everybody was in my group. So, because Auckland's an amazing place for that. Even Fungar is getting like that. It was just beautiful. Uh, but that is the one of the, I mean, one of the things I, um, you know, we hear about uh, females uh, when they're intoxicated and yeah. um, they're vulnerable. And and the problem I think we have in, um, right now is the whole idea of being intoxicated is good, that it's a good to be drunk off your face, but people don't realize that you put yourself and sometimes out of your, it gets out of your hand. And there are people always around who will take advantage of that. There's always yeah. someone in that little crowd of a hundred or some, ten or five who's looking out and making sure there's an easy target. And uh, and I think yeah. um, you know sometimes we forget that there are monsters out there, and we're proving that there are monsters out there tonight. So um, carry on yeah. with this um, with the train, please. Yeah. And mm. and so we we went back to the police station. They had um, the interesting thing about everything that you know that i'm just starting to realize is that moldy cop yeah he disappeared he was like pure, he was gone he did not want to have a bar of it yeah what had happened i never saw him again until the trial that that maori police officer and he drove us to the police station and that was the last time i saw him and, until the trial the silence, the silence. In this whole situation of having someone who should have your back, he's guilty right? by association. That's it. He is guilty by association because yeah. he chose to do nothing. He's just yeah. as guilty as the officer that was um, doing all the racial slurs and the assault yeah. and and you know um, and insinuating that they were going to um, rape me. But here's um, the thing. Here's the thing, right? He's a brown cop. He's a Maori cop. Mm. Mm. So there's a there's a um, there's a Brit cop who's racist towards another Maori person, and worse to a female Maori person. Right? Yeah. It could be anybody. It could be a brown cop yeah. doing that to a white female, and a white cop yeah. keeps watching. So the, the whole you know, yeah. that idea of you look to somebody and you go, "Are you? Will you protect me?" Right? You, you. Yeah. This is your job. You're protecting. You're supposed to uphold the law. You're supposed to protect me, and he doesn't. And so you're yeah. left even more vulnerable now. You're on your own. He, he struggled. Like I, I, just thinking about it. Actually, he was gone. I never ever saw him again. I didn't see him that night. I didn't see him again. And so <clears throat> they processed me. That was okay. You know, I had a sleep and then they let me out the next day. Um, when I went to court was when everything started to unravel mm. because mm. Um, their statements of what happened and my statement of what happened were two different, were, were conflicting. Hmm. There, and so the witnesses um, at court were the two police officers. Right. was the Pommy police officer, the Brit, and the Māori police officer. They were the two um, witnesses for hmm. the prosecuting sergeant. Okay, so this is all about them having to prove that I'm guilty of these things. Yeah. Um, so I was innocent until proven guilty. And right. so they charged me with resisting arrest, um, obstruction of a police officer, and assault. And so right through the whole um, process of going through court, I pled not guilty. I pled not guilty all the way. And so we got to the point where we had to go... Uh, I, I had to pick whether or not I wanted to go trial by judge or jury. Yeah. And I chose to go by judge. Now, the reason why I – there was a reason why, and this is what I mean by I knew I was going to get that police officer. 
for, and I don't mean I was going to get him in terms of, you know, going to take you, want you out. I mean, yeah. like, I'm going to make sure that you uh, made um, an example of what you have done. Yeah. And Can I just stop I you there for, for a second? Was this in the news? No. No. Okay, because no. I, I, I mentioned this uh, about the situation to a friend, and he said, "Oh, I heard about something in the news. Maybe he was thinking about the one in Auckland, um, that yeah. situation." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no. This one here was no. I didn't go to the newspapers or anything. This was a personal one for me. I did this one all on my own. Okay. I had no family with me at the courthouses when I went. I just it was something for me that I needed to see this right through to the end. And so I chose to go um, trial by judge, which yeah. means I only had to um, get one person, uh, one person to see my my story, to hear my story. Whereas when you go by jury, you've yeah. got 14, 10 to fourteen people that you have to prove your story to. And I only not had one. Yeah, and you don't know who they might, who is in there, and who might have a little hidden yeah. agenda. Who's under like yeah. the whole um, what exactly. what we call um, OTL, obey the law. Well, yeah. you broke the law, yeah. so you're going to do this, yeah. and you don't even know it's someone who might be in the middle and get swayed. And you know, and and this is the thing about juries. I don't. Uh, I mean, I've heard situations where the juries left off people that are on murder charges. I know he's manslaughter, mm. or he was on the right in New Zealand, and I'm like. Because you know what? what it is, is when you, um, a lot of people that do serious crimes will choose to go by jury. Because mm. if you go by jury, you, you, all it takes is for one person out of that 14 people to believe you. Yeah. And if they can't come up with the, um, they can't come to an agreement, therefore it gets thrown. And that's something that worries me about New Zealand, um, Court courtrooms and cases yeah. because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know they talk about overhauling the <laughs> sy uh, systemic, uh, you know, injustices right. and in, yeah. but yeah, and that and but yeah. people don't really understand how it works. And like you said, it only takes one person to sway the whole jury to your to the side. Yeah. And that person, hey, who knows where their um, alle allegiances lie or what they believe about yeah. things, you know? Because yeah. they might yeah. even want to protect their own ethnicity, right? It could be the, a Maori guy, they're trying to protect a Maori guy. Or there could be an Indian person wanting to protect an Indian person. Yeah. It's that sort of yeah. thing as well. It's like you never know what's going to happen in that situation. And we, we've, we've seen enough TV shows to see how it works, right? Oh, yes, and, definitely, yeah. And, yeah. They, they but, portray yeah. it pretty well in the, in the movies, mm. you know? It's quite funny how some of these movies can actually portray real events. Yeah. You know, uh, um, and they take those real stories because they know that it will sell, and they yeah. use them as storylines in a lot of their movies. You know, um, but so I went trial by judge, and the day that I went in um, was the first time that I had seen that police officer since the incident. Yeah, both of them, the Maori cop and the English cop, and yeah. the thing was when I saw their statements, and I was just in all because yeah. they both had correlated the same statement and yeah. then my my statement of events were very different to this but yeah. they had two people saying the same thing and I and me one person saying different mm. So they really thought they had the upper hand on me. Now, when, when we went into court that day, I was pulled into the um, into an interview room with my lawyer and the prosecuting sergeant. And the prosecuting sergeant put a deal on the table. Mm. And he said to me, okay, um, you know, we, we've offered a deal, a plea deal for, for, for you today. Um, we, we're saying that we will drop the resisting arrest and the obstruction charge um, if you plead guilty to assault. Assault on so, a police officer. So the deal is if you back down, we'll give you a lesser charge, even though you're yeah. innocent. And, um, yeah. and we've seen yeah. this happen in movies, like you just mentioned. Oh, yeah. 
yeah. they come yeah. up and and a lot exactly. of times this a lot of times people just go yeah man i just don't want to hassle i don't have the time for this i just want to get on with my life and i don't want to go you know i just want to get out of here at least yeah. you know yeah but you didn't no no because i had that fire in my belly from what that that guy had done to me mm. and that was the thing my, my the thing that pushed me right through to see it right through to the end was um staying true to me and what happened to me mm. and um making sure that i was going to highlight what that that police officer had done to me and, the other um, thing is, um, excuse me the other thing is that what about the, all the other people he's done it to or is going to? Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. And when you, if, you don't, if you don't step up now, what, right now, in this situation in court, what happens to all the other people that he might do the same thing to? Yeah, he does and what if, it gets, yeah. what if it gets out of hand? What if, the, you know, we've seen people get shot. Yeah. Or, you know, people get yeah. hurt really yeah. bad. Oh, and very. so... And here you are, uh, and you go, no, I'm not in the plea deal. No. <laughs> yeah, I said to them, um, nah, nah, no, you know, I'm not pleading guilty. I'm not, you know, um, no, I'm, I'm going to fight this. And they were like, okay, we'll see you in there. And so we went into court, and it was trial by judge, so there was nobody else in there but me. Um, the, two, uh, the two police officers in the back of the room um, my lawyer, the prosecuting sergeant in front of me, the judge, and the lady that sits in front of the judge, yes. and um, and correct corrections, um, corrections and victim support on the side. Yeah. And so the trial started before I went in on this particular day. I went in early to meet with victim support. Yeah. Now, victim support are very, very un underrated. They yeah. are one of um, – when you utilise them, yeah. you they can do a lot to support you when you go to court. It's it's actually yeah. – um, they're very – they're unutilised. They're, they're not utilised enough. And so victim support, what they said to me was, um, okay, would you like to write an impact statement that goes to the judge? And I said, mm -hmm. you know, what's an impact statement? Because I didn't know what it was. When they heard my story, they said, oh, we would encourage you to write an impact statement. It's an impact statement that tells the judge how the events that happened on the night have affected you um, uh, in, in real life, how, how it has affected you, the yeah. impact it's had on your life. And yeah. so I, I did one. I did an impact statement to the judge and victim support helped me. You know, they, they made it, they dressed it up to make it an impact statement, that it was right. going to impact on the outcome of the sentencing today, you know, on right. that day. So I wrote, wrote in there how, you know, um, I, I had no faith in the system. I, yeah. um, I, I, I I had like anxiety towards police officers. Mm. I, um, um, I have no respect. You know, I've lost. You know, I've lost a lot of respect for the system and the mm. um, the police. You know, the people that were supposed to be there to protect me. The things that they had been saying to me that it was that um, it was not okay. That right through this whole trial or right yeah. through the whole process. I've stuck to my everything that I've been saying hmm. and the fact that they are lying. You know, I said, you know, the statements that they are producing today and my statement are conflicting because they are lying. And um, when I went to the judge and the judge read about how I was put in a headlock, my I was dragged by my hair, um, I was called a black monkey, I was mm. told that they were going to rape me. When mm. the judge read that impact statement, he was in awe. He yeah. and, and I knew I could tell by the look on the judge's face that he it really affected him reading that impact statement. Mm. And he was like, "Oh, oh my God, what?" You know. Mm. And he he was like, he said to the he looked up and he looked at the prosecuting sergeant, mm. and he said to the sergeant. 
have you read this lady's impact statement? Prosecuting sergeant said, no, I haven't, Your Honour. And he said, I suggest you do so. So he yeah. gave a copy gave a copy to the prosecuting sergeant. Mm. And when the prosecuting sergeant was reading it, he was like, I could see his eyes were like wide. And, you know, he was like, this isn't, this, this, no, this can't have happened sort of thing. Mm. And then um, the judge said to me, I would like to call my fir first witness, and he called me to the stand. Yeah. And he he started asking me questions about the impact statement, about the things that I had said in my mm. statement and the impact statement. And so it was, I felt like we were just having a conversation, just like how you and I are having a conversation. He made me feel safe to tell my story mm. and um I, I he was compassionate towards me he was very about every single word and he said to me did he how did you feel when he dragged you by your head mm. um and i was just like well i felt helpless i felt like mm. you know um i didn't know who it was because they came from behind yeah. And that's why I turned and I defended myself the way that I did, Your Honour. Well, yeah. out goes the assault charge, you know, because I, mm. he saw that as me defending myself, you know, yeah. because he came from behind. He said, oh, I could – I totally get that because, you know, he came from behind. You wouldn't have seen who it was. And I said, no, mm. I didn't. Did he identify himself? No, he didn't. Mm. Did they tell you at any time that you were under arrest? And I said, after I had been dragged and caught, you know, yeah. put into a hold where they could get my the the handcuffs on me, was when they told me I was under arrest. Mm. You know, and um, and why I was under arrest, and then he he was just very compassionate towards the things that I had put in there. Mm. The um the. The defining moment for the court case <laughs> was when two police officers were put on the stand. Yeah. Was the defining moment for him. So he called the police officers to the stand and he called the um, the Māori police officer first. And um, he came up and he said, okay, you know, um, what happened? And he started to tell the story of what he saw and um, he got caught out because what he was saying on the stand and what he had put in the statement were two different things. And the mm. judge said, okay, I'm referring back to your statement made on da 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 da, -da um, on paragraph blah, 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 where you have put this. And the officer was like, well, Your Honour, I don't recall I can't recall exactly what happened, you know, and he started to trip up. Mm. And then he said, okay, I've heard enough. And then he asked for the um, British, the Brit to come to the thing. And that was when everything went south for the for the um, mm. case. I, I knew I had it. As soon as the, the white, the Brit cop got up and was speaking, he was mm. very ignorant, mm. like very ignorant, you know, and – the judge was like, he couldn't wait to ask him, you know. So um, I would like to ask you, you know, Miss Tapania has said that you, you called her a black monkey. Did you call her a black monkey? I don't recall that, Your Honour. Okay, so did you grab her by her hair and drag her 10 metres up the road? Well, I grabbed her from behind, Your Honour, but I yeah. might have grabbed her hair by accident. Mm. And he was like... Um, He's like, okay, let me remind you <coughs> that you are under oath. You, let, you do understand what I'm saying? And he said, yes, you know, ignorant as, yes, yes. And he's like, yes, your honour. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was really making um, an example of him, yeah. of that police officer. And he turned around and he goes, I've heard enough. Mm. I've heard enough. You can step down. Mm. Oh, but, but you know, oh, I've heard enough. You may step down. Mm. And then he just shook his head. He was like, 
I can't believe that this yeah. happened to you, Mr. Pania. And he was apologising. Is... Yeah, he the worst was apologising is... to me for hmm. what I had gone through. And the worst he thing is, to me uh, that. sorry, um, cats. The worst thing is that we don't realise it happened here. <laughs> Yep. In Northland, right family, yeah, family. It happened in our city. yeah, and yeah. Uh, and that's what really got me. It was like you know, it's not somewhere else. And this is why when I when I, when I see people posting stuff about somewhere else, I go, let's talk about what's happening here, because that's where we can impact. That's where we can talk about this. If we can reach into our community and try to make it better. Uh, it's all right talking about everybody elsewhere, but what about what's happening in our community? What's happening in our own backyards? How do we help our own backyards uh, get better? You know, and um, I think for for the judge to hear that somebody's doing yeah. this in his backyard, you know, yeah. even you know, I just when I, when I heard I was I was irate when I was hearing I was like in our backyard, you know, because I already know things like this happened here anyway. But when it gets to this point, it gets a bit yeah. out of hand. And and I you know and then the judge who's sitting there is going, it's a nine because they sit as as as, as judgment over their cities as community yeah, elders sure. and leaders as comatuas sure. over the sure. city because they're yeah. the last um, they're almost the last bastion of hope for those who are going to the courts and they have experience and for them to hear about things like this they they're going well we don't want to ha have it happen but they are also judges that don't give it right yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, very, very much. And I, I was lucky that I had – now, this judge was Judge Thompson. And, and back 16 years ago, everybody knew who Judge Thompson was. He yeah. he had a white beard and white hair, and but he was um, a very assertive judge, you know. But this day I saw a side of him that I, I haven't seen before. And um, the thing that, like, really resonated with, with me was when he said to me that um, it should be them on the stand. Yes. You should be doing these police officers for assault, not the other way around. Yeah. You well, should be the, the um, the, the prosecuting sergeant stood up and he was like, but Your Honour, you know, she 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 assaulted the police officer. She resisted arrest. She broke the law. She no. she obstructed them. She, Your Honour, she has broken the law. And the judge turned around and said to the prosecuting sergeant that I know how to do my job. I know mm. what has happened and yeah. I know that this is not okay. So I suggest you to seek and he was very, very um, – he, he made an example of every single one of those police officers in that in, in that um, courthouse that day. I'll mm. never, ever forget it because, for me, it was a very, very defining moment because, you know, I, I never, ever wanted to go back there ever again. Mm. You know, I, ne I never, ever wanted to go back there again. That was, like, for me, it's like I, I don't ever want to go – and have this happen ever again. Yeah. And so um, they the <laughs> the judge was like, I'm ready to make my um, judgment, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready to make you know, to sentence, you know. And when he said the sentence, he discharged Sorry, I didn't get that one again. Can you repeat the, um, repeat? um the the judge made his um his judgment and yeah. he he said I um Mr Pania, you know, you are charged with that that you know, uh, I am discharging this case mm. without conviction. Right. Um I will you will be fined seventy five dollars for the court costs for our proceedings today mm. and that's my final you know that 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 was that's my sentence. So I was uh, the it got thrown out. Yeah. And the the cops were just like they were in awe. They were they were just the the two police officers in the back just got up. Uh, you know, I've never ever seen them ever again. Um, One thing that worries me about this. 
did they get moved around? Did they get separated? And did they get to continue their work? Oh, you, you, you know, yes. and uh, and are they still in those positions, uh, or they've gone up higher up where they have more authority uh, to even teach? Right? Mm. Have underlings under them to show them what they can do, uh, how to behave towards a certain race or certain people. It doesn't matter which people. It doesn't matter which race. No, but no, when you have no, people no. in authority where they um, they don't lose their jobs when they've done something wrong. And I mean when they've convictedly done something wrong, when the, when the judge has said, you were in the wrong, now they should lose their job because we want law and order in our society as much as, but we also want to make sure that it's, 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 a, it's a just society we live in because, yeah. and a fair one, because otherwise we're going to have continue having this. We're going to have racist yeah. pops. We're going to have, um, you know, in our community. And um, I think, yeah. I, I worry. It's like it's like I mean, it's like what happened with the Catholic Church, right? When they found that something happened wrong, they just moved them to another position where they could carry on. Yeah. And this is what worries me when we have these sort of situations where, you know, um, where if some cop is is able to, you know, okay, so he gets a hand slap by his mates. Oh, you did a bad job. Okay, sorry, didn't work out. We're gonna move you somewhere else. You know, and that sort of thing. I, that, that always worries me when. Um, that sort of thing happens. So, you know, I wonder if, if um, you know, if they basically say, sorry, this job's not for you anymore. If this is how you're going to behave in our, in our workplace. Because I, I, I get a bit um, annoyed uh, in the difference between service and force, you know, because service is about helping the community and making sure that we do have a just and, um, you know, just and fair society. But then when they use, when they use the word force, that allows them to actually go, well, you shouldn't have used too much force there, mate. You know, maybe you should calm down a bit. And then later on, somewhere else, they can use more force. As we know, like, I mean, there's talk about how, like, in, um, you know, in uh, more ethnic areas, uh, there's some, there's heavily, more heavy police. You know, there's more more police call-outs and stuff, but there's also this chance because of alcohol and so on and drugs, there is more reason for that. But there's sometimes not that much reason for police to be there times and i think you know the com i think we've lost the community policing i, I that yeah, whole idea see, of the beat you know we still have community policing here in whangarei like so mm. they they have community police officers in onarahi and um, mm. they've got a community police office in kamo they've mm. got a community police station in otangere mm. so they, they still do have their community police but mm. um sometimes it, like oh it, it's really really hard because if you aren't doing anything wrong yeah then they see you as a law-abiding citizen right and they respect you in that way mm. you know what i mean but if you're a troublesome kid and or yeah. if you're you know, if you're doing you're doing things that you're not meant to be, or you know, then then it's it's like you know, it's always they're always watching you. You know what yes, I mean? Yes. And so yes. it, it it depends on the actions of um the the people that they are watching. Okay, there is discrimination. I believe yes. so. Yeah. You know, if you've got a little Maori boy standing on a corner and and uh, a you you know a Caucasian boy standing on the corner, they're not going to look at the Caucasian boy, they're going to look directly at the Māori boy. You yeah. know, I, I believe that, you know, there is discrimination when it comes mm. to um, our, our people. Mm. Um, but if you have done nothing wrong, yeah, um, majority of the time, you'll be okay. Yeah. You know, um, and for, for what, what we went through, um, when 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 that happened to me, the penalty outweighed the crime. Yeah. Well, for what happened to me, so um, what with the way they treated me hmm. outweighed why they had arrested me in the first place. Yeah. So because we were walking down the road and we said, "If the police," yeah, and then they come in and then they assault me. Mm. The penalty outweighed the crime. 
Yeah. You understand that? So, you know, oh, yeah. it would have been different if they come over and they said to me, you know, oh, you know, you need, don't go doing that. You know, you need to cut that out, Katrina. You know, don't do that again. It's not okay. Yeah. You know? And that's I would be I mean. like, oh. That's what I mean between service and force. Yeah. Right? They could have just said, hey, uh, you know, you know, next time if you say that some a hole is gonna actually take that to heart and be a bit aggressive. Okay, we're just gonna just carry on walking. Don't worry about those things. Oh no, no, no. We use the force of the law on you. Yeah. That we <laughs> and um, you know, this particular police officer that arrested my brother that um started all of this, you know, mm. chaos. He was he was very much a uh, um well known police officer in at that time, 16 years ago, that didn't like us, right. you know. We've seen, we'd seen it before, you know, coming out of the nightclub where they pick on the Māori boys, on mm. the cousins and the brothers and, you know, and, and we'd seen it for, for quite some time that this particular mm. police officer that done this, actually, yeah. he just picked on them he just picked on the you know the boys would be walking down the street and they'll, they'll pull up on them and next yeah. the boys are getting smart to them and they're getting taken away yeah it's it's, it's 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 actually going out of the way to seek conf um, confrontation yeah and yeah. causing to, to you know, like antagonizing antagonizing them knowing that they're going to get a reaction from it yeah. Knowing that they're going to react to it, you know, and if they don't get a reaction from that one, then they'll go up the road and they'll get a reaction from somebody else. Yeah. Because Which is what, like you said, more than likely happened on this case where the young boy that was on the bike that they pulled over didn't get a reaction from him. So they come mm. up here, got a reaction from us, and they got it all right, you know. And so, yeah. Um, a highlight for that, yes, innocent until proven guilty, LAW. That's law. Yeah. And when yeah. you get into the court, when you get into the court system, that's when you will understand that you are innocent until they can prove you guilty. And I then, think, I think the other thing that is here is, um, do they have a tariff? Uh, not a tariff. What is that called? A how much amount of things? Uh, how much um, arrest they have to make a night or a day? Oh, okay. They call it quoting. That's a quotas, right? Yeah, yeah, so, quotas. do the police have a quota? Uh, I know that police have quotas for um, ticketing. Um, uh, so, the highway police and also local police have a um, quota to meet to dish out um, tickets mm. for cars. You know, no warrant of fitness, no rego, yeah. no license. You know. They, they have a quota for they, – they do have a quota system for that. I know mm. that for a fact. They try to say that they didn't, but my my father was part of their forum group, was was a kaumatua for the police, and he was part of, part of the Taumata forum um, for Taitokero. Yep. And um, he he finally got them to admit that they, they quota um, ticketing systems for cars. The other thing is, um, with quotas, how do police advance through the ranks, right? It's a question that we should ask because the reason I, I say that is because job well done gets you a, you know, gets you merits or whatever in normal jobs. Yeah, gets, yeah. In yeah. any yeah, jobs, right? So how do they get yeah. that? How do they advance? Do they, is it because of the arrest they make, or is there uh, like um, to get to a detective, you got to be able to go through a whole lot of schooling, then you get yeah. to do a whole lot of detective work, and then you get your stripes and captain, then you get you know lieutenants, whatever. Yeah. But how does a beat cop advance up the ranks with without making arrests every other day? And I wonder that's where my quota idea comes from in my head. And I'm all um, with these things. It's always off the cuff when I'm having discussions because it's not something I think about beforehand. And so, no, no. you know, I, I, I mean, I've, I've asked for a police, uh, community police officer to come on and uh, have a discussion about community police work. I'm just waiting on that them to get back to me about it because I think there is a, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about what they do because or how they rank up and um, or also not only that but 
what our rights are now, not what our rights were six months ago, but now. Because a couple of weeks ago, they were able to tell us to stay in our houses. And, uh, and then they put in the, they gave them more law. Um, they gave them more, uh, what do you call it? More rights as officers to do more things to us. Uh, and, you know, to stop us, uh, to make us wear masks, you know, stuff like that, or into our houses without any uh, warrants. And somebody said, hey, they can do that anywhere. They can come on your property without any warrants anywhere. I'm like, yeah, but that was because it was a courtesy thing we could do with them. Say, like, look, you can come in or you can't come in. Just stay there. No, they can just come in, right? That was the whole idea that now without warrants, they could just walk into your house and we don't know what people they are, as we've seen tonight, you know, as you said tonight, that um, there are bad apples and we don't know if those bad apples are going to come in using those laws to just you know, do whatever they want. And uh, we know some bad apples and you've said what happened 18 years ago with that girl, you know, um, and, and we know these things happen. I mean, I was in Auckland in about um, 2000 and heard about um, this police officer used to use a girl as a prostitute, you know, mm, and there yeah. was a story about him using his friggin' baton on her in the, mm. in the rear, right? It's that sort of yeah. stuff. And because he, because he had the legal, uh, no, not the legal right. He had the stripes that, uh, and the uniform and, uh, uh, and the power, power over her because he, uh, because of what his um, status was. He wasn't just a beat cop. So because of what he was, his status was, he could say and do whatever the hell he want and could get away with it. And that's why I always question authority. I think um, we're so silly sometimes not to question authority and we just take it on board. And I love the way that you actually took these guys to task and oh, what happened with your brother? You know, because I mean, you know, he got a arrested, didn't he? Because yeah, for doing yeah, nothing. So, he was he arrested was for um, um, disorderly disorder behavior. behavior. Mm. And, and he was assaulted too. Mm -hmm. He was uh, he was beaten. He was he actually got it worse than we liked him. You know, um, but I guess. For me, it was um, some of the things that they had said to me that um, it was more the psychological abuse where my brother got the physical abuse. You know, he, he had the bruises and things like that to be able to. Yeah. But for him, he was just like, oh, well, you know, and brushed it off. But yeah. I think if he was, the shoe was on the other foot and he was the one being called a black monkey or being told that they were going to rape you, you know, I think he would have done the same thing. He would have pursued it a little bit more than what I did. Yeah. But um, for him, he sort of just brushed it off and was like, you know, um, oh, well, yeah, I I'm still here. And um, so, yeah, but just, just going on and uh, around um, the legislation just through the, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the, mm. um, the response bill that they've um, put out. Now, one of the things that we, um, that I always say to people, and I said it right through the lockdown, is that what they had put in place was not LAW. It was not law. Yeah. They were guidelines. And yeah. what when you when you speak um, and when you talk about anything to do with legislation or law or mm. anything to do with the government or the police, what you you need to listen to the narrative, what the words that they are saying, yeah, and then you can decipher what it really means. Mm. And so what they were saying was that they were saying that because of the guidelines that were put forward to us from the MOH, Ministry of Health, yeah. um, and the World Health Organization, the guidelines, based on the guidelines on the World Health Organization, um, the Ministry have, of Health have put together this COVID-19 pandemic response. Mm. And if you go back and you have a close listen to what they were saying, nobody said that it was law. Mm. Not once did until that bill got rushed through to government. The um yeah. the response, the pandemic response, the COVID nineteen um, bill uh, response bill, until that got rushed through, which was around about level 
end of level three? Yeah, no, it was level two. Oh no, yeah, it was level three because yeah. we were coming out. It was yeah. like this is what um, yeah. I was talking to um, uh, Jared Taylor, my co-host. Um, we have sometimes on here. He said the same thing. It's like, why are we needing it at level three when we just finish? This should have been at level one or level two. This is when we yeah. could have you know say this is what the law is. But at level three, it doesn't make sense. Of course, it doesn't no. make sense because no. why would they need it when we are allowed to go outside now? Allowed to do whatever we want yeah. and. Yeah because they were guidelines and that was exactly the same thing um, because when, when my dad passed in level two, he was unwell in level three and so we had a hundred people I mean we were only allowed to have ten people if anything yeah. had happened to my dad at level three and what I kept explaining to everybody was I said to them the, this is not law it is guidelines. They they are guidelines and not law. You know, I said if we have more than ten people here, they cannot come and arrest you mm. because they are only guidelines that they that they are telling us. And um, the thing with guidelines is they gave us the choice mm. to follow those guidelines and stay home like they were saying and do all the things that they were saying to do, mm. um, we had a choice. We could have chosen not to do it and yep. gone out and just gone gone off and doing, done what. But, and, and this is what I mean by um, when they always say, oh, Jacinda, doing, she, she saved us. The yeah, government, the Labor government, they saved us. No, they didn't. No. We, we saved us. We yeah. the people, we started to wash our hands. We started to wear a mask. We started yeah. to sanitize. We started to social distance. We yeah. chose to stay home. And so, therefore, we the people of New Zealand kept us all safe. Yeah, because we're concerned about our communities. We're concerned about our families. We're concerned about neighbors. I mean, uh, when we were going into it, I was like, okay, we'll do this. We'll protect ourselves and we'll, you know, we'll um, get our food in time, uh, prepare for four weeks. And, and then when, I, when the, when the whole law thing came in, I was like, yeah, no, you know, you, you guys are now pushing something else that doesn't feel yeah. right. And of course, as yeah. you said, it's, they went from guidelines to making it a law just before yeah. we opened the doors yeah. and um, yeah. taking our freedoms yeah. away. And I think, uh, and then the other thing that really pissed me off was track and trace at level three. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. I, 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 um, I just don't like it. I don't like no, it. I mean, no. I, I leave enough footprints over the internet as it is. I, um, I don't want uh, my neighbors know, you know, the government knowing where I am every minute of the day. It, you know, it is a pandemic. They, it's a plan. Yeah. It, everything is, nothing is done just overnight. It is a plan. And yeah. th this is the thing that a lot of our people need to do is they need to wake up. They need to see yeah. it for what it is. And don't believe everything that is being portrayed on social media. Don't believe everything that they're mm. saying in the news because they are controlling the narrative. Yeah. They are okay. controlling what you hear and what you see. Yeah. And if you don't go out and you look between the lines and you read between the lines and you go out and do your own research into it, you will just be a sheep. Yeah. And you will just follow what everybody else does. And they are just as bad as people that stand there and do nothing when someone is being hurt. You yeah. are just as guilty as that, you know, that Māori police officer is just mm. as guilty as that Brit, um, police yeah. officer for doing nothing about it. Yeah. And so the sheep yeah. are just he, as, uh, as much to blame for this being able to continue how it is. Um, going back to that, so um, there was this thing that uh, that popped in my head when we, you know, way back when I was listening to you talk a couple, you know, a couple of weeks ago uh, about this, and this is a song, "Good Cop, Bad Cop" by um, uh, I think it's LL Cool J. Oh uh, no, Ice Cube, right? Yeah. Back in the, uh, I think it's from back in the nineties, right? And um, yeah. and uh, yeah, this one, uh, black black police showing out for the white cop. 
uh, yeah. white cop showing up for the wet cop, uh, black police showing up for the white cop, white cop sh uh, police showing up for the wet cop. And, uh, and it's the whole story. Uh, I remember because um, I wasn't into the, the gangster rap until I got to Auckland because I was into Public Enemy, uh, you know, when I was back in Mordor. And, uh, and, um, and so I was, you know, I had the whole um, uh, idea of what was happening in the ghettos when I was a young kid at 13 or 14. And because of it, but well, when you were talking about that, I was like, this, my mate used to have this. And I never really, really listened to it, but the words popped in my head, right? And the whole idea of, um, you know, you've got the good cops, you've got the bad cops, but you've got the good cops that just show up for the white cops, you know, yeah. or the racist cop. Yeah. It doesn't matter what mm -hmm. the, who, who the, who the, what color it is. If you're standing by and not speaking up when someone is, like you said, someone is being racist, someone's being violent in their position of authority, then you're just as culpable. It's like the officers yeah, in, 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 yeah, in Nazi that's, Germany, that's right? It's like yeah. the, Nazi, the officers in Nazi Germany. Oh, we were just obeying the law. Oh, we're just following yeah. our commanders. We were just doing what we yeah. were told. Yeah, but actually, yeah. you then had... You are a, just as guilty. Right, mm -hmm. because when it comes to justice, if you're there and do nothing, then you know you're um, you, you're not um, you're actually just as bad. But here's the thing that popped into my head just then. We have this new idea about you know how if somebody um, about consent. This is the weird thing about consent when it comes to females and males. Uh, someone got done for uh, assault on trying to um, giving mouth to mouth to a drowning female. You know um, this is like last year, yeah. and and I was thinking. Because I've drowned a couple of times, and I've been saved a couple of times, and um, and I've actually saved people from drowning. Young kids, when I was a young child, doggy paddling to you know, uh, and um, as a uh, wakarapa across a baikayo there, that the river, you know, yeah. we had yeah. I had little kids hanging off my friggin' arms while I was trying to doggy paddle to save them, and um, and I've been saved a couple of times as well, you know. Um, I guess that's a karma <laughs> from drowning, but. But imagine you're drowning and a guy comes up and he's trying to save your life and you turn around and take him to court and say, you assaulted me. This is stopping people from doing, from stepping up to help people. And, you know, uh, this is what I, th I think is, is going to cause more problems in our society when you can't, when you're not allowed out of fear to help people, you know? And I think um, in this well, situation, it's been yeah. COVID is uh, clear. Like this is uh, this. That's exactly what it is. So, if if somebody, um, so when I went for my first aid, I went for my first aid in the last year, and um, they said that uh, when when giving mouth to mouth, yeah, you you cannot give mouth to mouth unless you have one of those plastic things that they put over your over their mouth otherwise they advise against it right if you if you do perform cpr on them and they have anything like they could have hiv or hep c or something like that and you can track that then you did that on your own um mm. consent yeah yeah you know um but they they advised during our first aid that those those plastic things is something mm. that we should always have in our first aid kits. Yeah. And, and, you know, he was really, really adamant. And, well, now that we have COVID, yeah. you know, and it is, it is shared through saliva, yeah. you know, it, it can be shared through kissing and yeah. uh, through, through droplets. Yeah. Um, so you know, if somebody is is drowning, they they could have COVID, and then and then you've you've got it. The thing is, for me with COVID, is it's a virus. Yeah. It's a it's it's just like all the other viruses that we exactly. have. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's just like SARS. It's a it's another form of SARS that's just been you know, mutated into something else. And, mm. you know, every year they seem to come out with something different. Yeah, some new why, uh, flu. <laughs> why did they take this virus, this particular one, and make it into a pandemic? Not yeah. a pandemic. They planned mm. everything that was going to happen 
once it was in a so you have the outbreak yeah you know you had the the epidemic and then you have the pandemic you know and so um when when it comes pandemic it means it's worldwide you know yeah. and and that was the thing they made sure and they ensured that it was going to go pandemic mm. that it was going to go right around the world you know and um the it's almost like it was planned yeah everything that happened afterwards just it was too coincidental mm. with what she- they were saying they um, especially when it comes to people like Bill Gates, you know, yeah. um, who you know, who owns shares yes. in the World Health Organization, you know, yeah. um, and the elite, you know, there people think that when we when we start to talk about the elite and you know, um, and, and Freemasons and you know, they they're like, oh, you know, we we oh, well, who are they? What when you need to do your own research on and around think, that for you to be able to understand what that is. Um, because they most, have a plan. With most people, there is this, um, because they're so busy with everyday life and um, with everyday um, you know, situations, feeding their family, going to work, uh, taking care of the kids, making sure they get to school, they have enough clothes to wear, enough food and things. And um, they, they, they don't have the time just to, um, to actually... Uh, have communications with each other they don't have time to uh, research and stuff and they just sign away everything and agree with whatever is going and i think uh, and you see this with like when uh, when when you hear people getting interviewed on tv you know or they just take a little clip and, and then they make a huge half hour deal about it out of just one little thing like the other day was something about trump just uh, stepping down and they made a you know because somebody held his hand and i was like is that news you know, is that what you're supposed to tell us? I mean, why aren't you telling us about what he talk, talked about in his speech? Because that's more important, what he yeah. says. Or even, if, even can, with anybody else. They, they control the narrative. If you, yeah. are, you know, watch them very, very clear, carefully. The moment that any one of those um, independent media sources hmm. release anything that jeopardizes this pandemic, hmm. it gets shut down very, very quickly. But... Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I shared just recently, and you might want to have a look at it, have a look into it, was um, Forbes. Forbes, 10 most richest people in the world. Mm. So during the epidemic, during the pandemic, when the whole, everybody's economies um, froze. Yeah. Over over the pandemic, um, over COVID-19. Um, Bill Gates... The um, top three, the top three um, richest people in the world, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is the third. Yeah. So during the during the pandemic, he um, they he was eight hundred and thirty million dollars richer than what he was before the pandemic. Eight hundred and thirty million dollars more. Yeah. And so, you know, um, how can everybody else's economies stop but these guys yeah. make eight hundred and fifty million dollars more? The other the um, other thing is uh, we're almost there. Yep, we're almost on the closing time. Um, but um so I think this is the thing about this is that um, a lot of people don't have time to st- research. And uh, when you yeah. start sharing stuff that they that they don't understand they shut it down or they just go, oh, you just don't know what you're talking about. And, um, but I think um, the great thing is about now is that we're able to, you know, get a control, I'm uh, not control, but share what we want and talk about what we want and the thing. And the yeah. weird thing is you keep saying the narrative, my show is actually called the narrative. I just don't say it because yeah. it's, it's, it comes yeah. up on the title. And, and that's because yeah. everybody has a narrative. And there's a reason why I said that because um, as a writer, we, you know, when you're writing a story, you control the narrative. You control yeah. who's the good guy, yeah. who's the bad guy, yeah. who's the villain, and who's going to be just a normal supporting actor. But you control how the story is played out. And this is what people don't um, tend to understand in our society is that people make money off mu- news. Yes. Yeah. You know, they make money off platforms and social media out things. 
and uh, and uh, conflict and aggression and uh, um, and stuff like that makes more money than it was a nice day today. It was a beautiful day. We had a good time. Nothing to ever report. No, that doesn't make money. So, but what makes yeah. money is conflict and aggression, and um, and the more angry people are, the more money they make. And I think um, sometimes I think we think that um, anger and all that will get us to what we want to do. As we saw, as this guy used his anger and whatever he was going on, racism against you. But then the then the judge comes in and goes. You know, we're going to be quietly deal with this as you went along and put through your case. And um, and here's the thing that a lot of people don't understand that um, when you're assaulted, it stays with you for a long time. Uh, the words used, the violence 16, used. 16 yeah. years, and I still can remember it. Yep. Word for word, minute by minute. You know, I can still remember it like it was yesterday. I, yeah. you know, when I know that I've, I've healed from it, I can talk about it without crying. You yeah. know, I, I can I can speak about this without crying. But I tell you what, two to three years after everything happened, I was still, it was still very real and raw for me. You know, I, yeah. I still would shed a tear. But now I can talk about it 16 years later. I think... Um this one thing I I, I, um, I really appreciate about people because I never used to think about that um, when I was younger, you know, about how having to deal with things. I remember one time somebody told me that they'd been assaulted and I had been assaulted and I just passed it off. And I still feel bad about that to this day. It was 20, 25 odd years ago. I still fight, feel bad because I was already dealing with my own crap. Because I was dealing with yeah. my own crap, I didn't care about anybody else's crap. And, um, yeah. and the thing is that we, um, you know, the only way we can help others is if we're, if we, if we're able to deal with our own stuff and you know, what we're dealing with ourselves. And, um, that is probably the only way we can help each other and help our society is if we actually take care of, you know, what's happening in our lives. And I love the way that you actually have done that. And uh, we didn't talk much about uh, social work, but I mean, we did cover a little bit last time. But this week, just tell me, you 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 had a few, you had a um, uh, how many much time have you got left? So uh, we can I've still got ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Let's, let's do the so social work up. thing. Social work yeah. thing. Sorry, the social worker yeah. thing. So let's talk about that because I don't want to miss out on this and letting up um, letting our um, yeah. our viewers know this because especially locally here. Um, yeah. what's, so, you know, because... um, I, I'm a support worker and my role, um, mm -hmm. so I, I'm a Fano support. So what a right. Fano support does is I support Fano families. Mm -hmm. So it could be anything um, that I support them with. But my role is currently Oranga Tamariki. So I'm Fano support worker. That means I work for the families. I don't work for the police. I don't work for Oranga Tamariki. I don't work for anybody. I work for the families. So I'm a Fano support worker. So therefore, I fight for the rights of our people. And my role, my role is Oranga Tamariki. And so um, for me, it's about um, trying the, the light at the end of the tunnel is to, to and get our babies out of the system and back into the home with their mums and their dad in a loving, caring home. Yeah. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. How we get there, the road to get there is very long. It's very mm -hmm. tedious. It's very strenuous. But um, once you have um, stepping stones put in, in place, it, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier. And so... For for me, it's about um, so when when you when one of your babies get put into Oranga Tamariki and that there's a this report is, of concern. Uh, this is um, uh, what is it? Foster care, isn't it? We're we talking about here. Yes, state care. State care. Yeah, state care. And so, state care is when children get taken from the parents and put into the government's care state care and put yeah. into the uh, Ministry of Children 
And then the Ministry of Children, who who run, who own Oranga Tamariki, the Ministry of Children then put these babies into a home that they think or feel mm. Or, mm. or, you know, think is safe. Yeah. Um, these homes are, you know, they are meant to be put through the processes of, you know, um, who all lives in the home, uh, any convictions of anybody that lives in the home, are they good foster care parents, you know. Um, there are interim foster care and mm. then there are permanent. Yeah. So interim is when a child gets uplifted from the parents because of the reports of concern. They get taken from the parents and they get put into interim custody, which means that they, they could go to a hotel with a social worker, mm. one of Oranga Tamariki um, social workers, and they could go into a hotel and stay there for the night with the child until they find somewhere for that child to go. Mm. And they'll go and take, okay, there's a foster home over here. They've got three children there. Okay, we'll put that child over there too. And we'll leave that one there until we go to court and find out what's going on. Yeah. And um, my uh, role, my role. I've, is, sorry, um, I've actually been in that in that court um, that um, that situation uh, where I watched a friend's child being taken and put into that interim care, and yeah. Um, yeah. and and seeing what that sort of care was it wasn't always good. And wasn't no. always, you know, and sometimes can be good, but wasn't always good. Seeing that, yeah. uh, and because of um, separation of families, yeah. you know, and um, and um, watching a baby um, be shared by somebody else, this is family, and not the family. It is. Um, it is one of the um, hardest. Um, positions to have to be in you know when when your children when children are being taken even when they're not your children even yeah. when they're not your children when when a child is being separated traumatically from a mother and father and put into the care of total strangers it's a traumatic event yeah. and that child will be affected by that for a long time oh. um babies babies the reason why they take babies the reason why they take babies is because babies will settle quicker because mm. they're just babies. As yeah. soon as they start to get like three, four, five, they know who mum and dad are. They know they know who they're meant to be with. They, they, they have bonded with their mum and they've bonded with their dad. And so yeah. when they're taken at three, four, you know, even at two, two, three, four, it becomes very traumatic. Yeah. And – I don't mind. Um, so when when they're taken into care as babies, hence the reason why they uplift from birth is, is because it's less traumatic for the baby. It's more traumatic for mother, for mum. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very, very, very traumatic for mum, but less traumatic for the baby. Yeah. And, and that's why it's a lot easier to take newborn babies than it is to take babies that are already connected with their mother and their father. Yeah. You know, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I do believe that some parents don't have the ability to be able to look after some of their, their children. Definitely. Some parents don't ha provide safe environments for their children, don't give them give their children the you know, um, basic needs that that child needs, you know, food, um, clothes on their back, a roof over their head, stability, you know. Um, I do believe that some of our parents don't have that. Um, and, but one one of the things that I always, I fight for wholeheartedly is that if that child is going to be taken from mum and dad, that he be put with Fano. Yeah. Hapu iwi. So what we mean by Fano Hapu iwi is Fano is like auntie, uncle, um, koro, nan, papa. That's Fano. Hapu becomes a little bit wider. So it, be, it could be um, a great aunt, or mm. you know, um, your your mum's 
your your mum's mother's sister, who is a great aunt. It could, you know, that's Tano Hapu. So it goes wider out into the community. Like so so we go directly to Fano, auntie, uncle, cousins, um, grandma, grandpa, you know, grandmother, grandfather, um, none of them are suitable. Then we start to look at Hapu, which yeah. is um, a great auntie or uh, a great uncle or, you know, um, and then Iwi, you know. And my, so Iwi um, is... My, my dad was placed into Hapu after he lost his parents yeah. uh, around in World War Two, And, yeah. it, you know, that sort of situation could have gone good or bad and uh, didn't well, work out well in that situation. Yeah. So um, yeah. I love the... Um, I, uh, I, 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 it's... The damage from all the sort of situations uh, oh. from where parents that, yeah. that lose the, their the, kids and then and, the, and, uh, the trauma, the trauma caused from it, um, uh, it can create um, damaging effects for, for the mum, for the dad, for the children for a long period of time. And if you don't address those issues, they mm. will um, they will become intergenerational where they will then yeah. go through, more than likely go through the system as well if you don't address yeah. those issues. And so for me, like I said, the light at the end of the tunnel is for that child to be returned to its mother and father mm. um, in a safe, caring environment. Yeah. And so what that means is that we put plans in place. Um, you know, this is a system of Oranga Tamariki. They put what they call family group conferences together where they put these big plans together for mum mm. and dad to um, address the issues that are happening within the home. So whatever the concern is, so it could be drugs or alcohol or it could be domestic violence or it could be... Um, transient lifestyle, not having um, a home and, and being homeless and things like that. So we, we look at what the issues are in the home, what the concerns are, and then we ensure that we put a, a plan in place that's going to be achievable. Mm. Because what I have found with the plans in place for families are unachievable. Mm. It's, it's unachievable. And so once the plan becomes unachievable, it falls over. And then they put another plan in place and that falls over. And then they put another one in place and it falls over. So therefore it goes to court and they are ordered and they take the baby because all they've tried, plan fell over three times, fallen over, and now we think that that, that baby is um, shouldn't be with that parent because they can't achieve the plans that we've put in place, so therefore we need to remove that child from the home. Yeah. And so um, the main goal for me as the Fano support worker is to ensure that the plan gets completed. That's mm. one of those tick boxes. Okay, you've got to go and do an alcohol and drug course. Come on, Fano, I'm picking them up. I'm dropping them off. You're going to your course. Once you've completed that, tick. Okay, the children have to go to counselling. All right, let's go, Fano. Kids are going to counselling. Tick. Mm. You know, what else is on the plan? Oh, we've got to go. We've got to do a drug test. Okay, drug test. Let's go, Fano. Tick. Once all the things on that plan are done, therefore there are no more concerns in the home. Therefore, mm. there's no reason why Oranga Tamariki needs to be involved. And we step in as whānau support to support that whānau and Oranga Tamariki step out. Yeah. And that is pretty much in a nutshell what we are trying to do with our whānau is just get them to do tick the boxes, to do all the courses, parenting courses, everything that they have put into those plans so that you can tick them, tick them, tick them, and then we say to them, okay, now whānau hapu iwi will support this whānau, oranga tamariki, you guys can step out. Yeah. And the babies come out of the system and back into the home with the whānau. And then we support the families in the home. So one of the things that, um, that, that I've learnt through the processes 
is that um, I have to work closely with the parents. Yeah. You know, you, you pick, you fix the parents, fix the children. Yeah. You know, um, so uh, whatever the issues are with the parents, we work on those issues. We bring in other service providers. So one of the things that I rely very, very heavily on is um, strategic strategic partnerships. So um, local Māori, Ngāti Hene, Ngāti Hene Health, um, Kia ora Ngāti Wai, um, Safe Man, Safe Family, all yeah. local, all local iwi providers. And those yeah. are the ones that I reach out to. Hey, you know, I, I've got a whānau that needs this. You know why? Because they already get funding for it. Yeah. They and already think... get funding to help those whānaus so mm. I always go directly to them and I say to them, hey, I've got a whānau that needs AOD. I've got a whānau yeah. that needs domestic um, violence uh, training. You know, they, they need to go do some parenting programs. And rather than us doing it, I take them to these organisations to tick off their boxes because at the end of the day, they are the ones that get the funding from it. I my cynical brain is always always when it says when there is they need these issues to happen in our society so they can keep the funding going. <laughs> You're not I, the first one to say that either. You know, you know, like, and, let's, um, let's keep them. Um, let's keep our Maori people in a constant place yeah. of need. And um, they make this money moment? of yeah. the grief of our people. Yeah. They, and, they make money off the grief of our people. And I always think, like, if we would just start taking responsibility for our own selves. Um, and so we don't have to keep keep making people think that we we are in need all the time. You know, I hate that whole idea of it's, oh, they, they're getting another handout again. They're getting another handout again. It's like, when are they going to be enough? And I, and I kind of think of the same way myself. I've said, when is it going to be enough? But then I realize in my head. It's not going to be enough because they want you to be always in need because, yeah. you know, to be in need means that you're not helping yourself, that you're not in control of your own individual individuality in your own hapu, in your own tribe, in your own iwi, as you said, um, because that's where the support is for you, you know, for the, for the young. It's like, hey, uncle said not to be naughty. Otherwise, yeah. uncle's going to yeah. tell daddy. You know, we, yeah. we had that in yeah. the old days, you know, where yeah. you could say, you can't play up because you're going to get told by, to mum. Mum's going to give you a ring, yeah. you know. What is yeah. that, a clap around the ears? Yeah. So, so discipline is, um, so the world in which we grew up in, you know, you, yeah. you and I, no longer exists. It yeah. no longer exists. As much as we talk about it and as much as we say, you know, back in the days, you know, we were uh, we were disciplined, we were we got waxed if we did this, that no longer exists. Yeah. You know, because if we whack our children, we're going to be in the system. Yeah. You know, so the, so the, system, the system has been set up for for us to fail. Yeah. Because and I, I was whacked when I grew up. My mum was whacked when she grew up. My mum's mum was more than likely whacked when she grew up, but that no longer exists. So the world that we grew up in actually no longer exists. And so um, we it's hard because if we talk about it, about what it used to be like, it, it, it's no use. It's of no use because... Yeah. We can't actually implement what we used to do back in the days into right. society now. And, that's, and, and, and so right. the, the system has been set up to fail, you know, for yeah. us to be able to fail. And and one of the things that, that we are looking at in terms of whānau hapu iwi is building our own system. Yeah. Building our own Māori Council, our own governance, our, yep. our you know, and and the funding streams will will always be there for us as Māori. For the simple yeah. fact that Te Tiriti, and this is the thing, with our Indigenous people here, mm. what sets us apart from every other Indigenous race out there is yeah. we had a treaty. Right. 
we we had an agreement between us and the crown. Yeah. And so therefore that treaty, te treaty, is the only thing that allows us to be able to um continue to do the work that we do. So we hold fast to te treaty because yeah. that um and if you have a look at all the other indigenous races around that the world, the, they yeah. don't have look at the American Indians, they have nothing. Yeah. Yep. They have absolutely nothing. They, they, you know, they Hawaii. They, they have, you yep. know, we. What sets us apart as an indigenous race is the fact that we had a, a treaty. Yep. We had an agreement between us and the crown, right. and that is, um, that is why we will forever have that funding, that funding stream, yep. is because of that um, agreement between Māori and the Crown. So the Crown has an obligation to us, mm. you know, um, to us as Māori, to, you know, because of our, what, what our tūpuna had done back in the day, what our ancestors have set up for us, yeah. you know. Um, and so that's, so when we when they talk about like, oh, you know, the Māoris have this and the Māoris have that and the Māoris have this and the Māoris have that, the Maldives have this and that because we have a treaty to say so. Right. That the crown is obligated to take care of us, mm. you know, to to ensure that we don't lose our ro cultural and indigenous rights. Right. So, yeah, the as long as that treaty is there. The other thing of it is on the other side of that is like, um, it's all these because of all these um disconnections to uh yeah. to the community and uh to the iwi hapu um in whanau we see so much of the other side in our cult uh, in us you know um the negative side yeah that we see yeah. of of this all and and the failures of the system to continue making um you know the idea that we can just keep relying keep relying on that and of course, people are going to get annoyed, but we know the treaty is there for a reason and it's there to protect and provide. But the other question is like, um, are we, are, you know, uh, um, are we helping our own final to actually say, come on, use these provisions, use these fundings to better yourself instead of being so reliant for only getting that tokenism that you were talking about in the last yeah, thing. Yeah. Yes, and, and so ur urbanization, urbanization, urban Māori, they've urbanized us. And yeah. urbanization has made us rely on the system. Now, um, uh, 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 a great example is when we go home, back to where my dad's from or back to the far north, out to the bush, out to the coast, Yeah, we don't need power, we don't need water you know we've got a generator that can you know we've got a water pump that can bring up water from from the creek to come up to the house we've got a generator to be able to run our power we've mm. got um we've got running water we've got uh sustainability we, we we can go you know hang a cow we can just go down and hang a sheep or a pig um yep. and feed our whanau for four to five weeks we have marakai, we, we, we're able to, our soil up in the far north is, uh, we can grow anything, yeah. you know, um, and we are, it's in our genes, it's some, it's, yeah. it's in our genes to be able to um, grow, you know, because our ancestors did it and our forefathers, they all did it, it's in our genes and the thing is, those are our customary rights. Yeah. Cust customary rights means that it's things that have been handed down from generation to generation. My mum's right. a gardener. Her father was a gardener, you know, mm. and so they hand those customary rights down to us because mm. we're their children. So my my mother gives it to us. M my mother's father gave it to her. Mm. Uh, his father or his mother gave it to him. Customary mm. rights, you know, where we don't need that we don't need the system to be able to survive we as a people could live off the land but 
the government doesn't want that. The government doesn't want us to be able to be sustainable. They want us mm. to rely on the system so that they can say to the Treasury, the Treasury, the Crown, yeah. you know, yeah. um, they can say to the Treasury, oh, we've got 30,000 Māori living in Whangarei. We need um, $300 million for those mm. Māori to make sure that we, we, we keep their real one alive. We keep their mm. customary rights alive. And then they've got $300 million to be able to allocate to that area. But see, because when we go north, when we've got, let's say, we've got uh, 2,000 people in the area, you know, up home. Yeah. We don't need anything. We, we you know, we they're trying to give us 5G. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is this is how that they, um, they are trying, they, they knew that they couldn't give us anything. We had everything up there. We didn't need to mm. rely on any funding. We didn't have to ask them for anything. You know, mm. the government, we, we're not reliant on the government up home. The people aren't relying on the government. But um, so they are coming in and they're doing things like, you know, oh, we, we've got all this um, putia there, this funding there to, for your marais. You know, um, and oh, we've got all this funding here for for, um, for you guys to be able to get 5G so you guys can get broadband and then you guys could be online and you, mm. you guys, you know, we you guys will be able to keep in contact with the rest of the world. What for? Mm. You know what I mean? What do they need that for? They don't need it. You guys want them to have it. Yeah. You know, and, and so they are slowly starting to come in and offer things to those little um, urban um, uh, villages and that, you know, no, um, trying, no, to just, get yeah. them, trying to get them into the system. Yeah. Because once once they get, you know, that, oh, 2000 that's another $200 million that we could allocate to that, you know, because of how many Māori are in that area. Hmm. You know, and they make they and hence the reason why they use Maori a lot is because of that, especially um, especially at, at, at um, election time, especially at election yeah. time. Yeah, and this and because, and, because uh, of the obligation that the crown has to yeah. um uh and for the treaty, and so yeah. the government is able to use that as a way to get more money. Yeah. And votes. You know, you, you have to provide it for us because we have to keep their cultural rights and we, we have to be able to provide them with that. And so, yeah. oh, we're going to need $300 million this year. Yeah. And that's what they do. They apply for money on the backs of how many Māori are in what area um, yeah. and, and, and depending on, you know, low socioeconomic areas get more money because – They've got deprivation and they've got ch the children in the welfare system and children in Oranga Tamariki. So, oh, we're going to need 500 million for, for that. Mm. And they make, they apply for money off the backs of our people through the obligations that the Crown has through Te Treaty. And the other side of that, by them doing that, by targeting it that way and wording it that way, they're actually making um, ways to antagonize, sorry, to antagonize non-Maori. And I've oh, watched oh, this. Very. And very. to make non-Maori yeah. um, upset at seeing um, seeing uh, Maori get their um, their rights, their financial rights handed to them because it's obligation to them and they've got a treaty. Yes. But they do it in a way to make non-Maori feel, feel angry to see them getting yeah. some more money. Why are they getting it more? Why are they getting this there? Why are they getting that there? Why are they always in need? And of course, yeah. like we said, it's a system to make to fail. And because the other thing is, um, and there's other people overseas have talked about this, the this destruction of the family. Uh, to take children away, as we talked about, uh, Oranga Tamariki, uh, parents not being able to look after themselves or look after their um, their children. But by doing that, you're just creating generational need. You're right. Yeah. You, you're make, making generations, and like you said last time, six generations of uh, beneficiaries. Of wealthy. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, those people have relied upon government uh, handouts for six generations without actually saying, you know, I think I can do better for myself if I can just step out of this and get a bit more education, maybe use a little bit of this uh, put away and get me through whatever I need to get to, you know, um, and learn about budgeting and all these things that are available anyway. But I, the more... Um, Reliant were upon the nanny state, as um, you know, as you know, you know, uh, as they call it sometimes. The more we become helpless in our own individual uh, goals to better ourselves and our community, and um, and the, I think um, key, I, I think the key thing in that order there is intergenerational. Yeah, and uh, you know, six generations of beneficiaries. You know, and and I guarantee there's a lot more out there that oh, yeah. are, are a part of that. You know, six yeah. generations. You know, and it's intergenerational. So you only know what you know. Yeah. So if if you're brought up in a home where your dad and your mum were on the benefit, mm -hmm. chances are that's all you're going to know. Yeah. You know, their parents were on a benefit. So that intergenerational thing is is real. That that mm. is where it needs to be broken. Yeah. That that is where it's up to us, the generation of today, to make yeah. that change. Because yeah. I do believe, I, I do wholeheartedly believe that we are the generation of change. Yeah. Because um uh, um you know I. I I work very, very hard, but mm. I'm not just about money. Like you know, um, wealth. What 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 those out there think is wealthy to them, or is rich in in mm. money and houses and cars and boats. Mm. Um, e everybody is different in wealth. You know, no. I look at myself. I go home back to Pawaringa and look at how beautiful our land is. Mm. I'm rich. I, I'm rich. I'm very, mm. very rich. You know, I'm rich in knowledge. I'm, yeah. I'm rich in so many other ways, not just with money. Because mm. I tell you what, all that money that's going into the funding streams, majority of it goes to these organisations that are mm. called what they called government organizations, yeah. Māori iwi organizations. They get majority of that money. And if you have a look at their overheads to run an organization like Te Puni Kōkiri, mm. you know, Housing New Zealand, by the time that $500 million that gets given to that organization, yeah. $200 million of it has gone just on overhead costs to buy the oh. building. To buy everything, to buy the desk, the chair, the phone, everything within that business to be able to run that business as a business. Uh, I'm glad you raised that because just last year we had Te Puni Kokori uh, move into Whangarei. And my Maori yeah. friend, uh, and he, I spent more time with him than anybody else, said to me, say, why do we need that here? Another one of those. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. what do you mean? He goes, well, yeah. we don't really need that here. And I looked inside and it was like brand new everything. Yep, brand, brand new, new everything. everything. So that $500 million, $200 million have gone just like that. So it's what we call a filtered system. So people might think, oh, my God, they're getting $500 million. But really, by the time it's filtered down to the people, there's only going to be a good, oh, we'll be lucky if we get $20 million put into the community. And if you split that $20 million between the families that need it, it's not a lot. Yeah. You know, because you got to pay your CEOs that sit there and tick the boxes and sign those books. And then the CEO <laughs> has a PA and yeah. he's got a second in charge and he's got a PA and he's got a PA to his PA. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a filtered system. So by the time the money filters down through the government organisations, through the iwi organisations, down to our people, there's not yeah. a lot left. And that's, what, uh, and that's basically it, isn't it? And then you see yeah. uh, that there's not yeah. much help being given to who the people that actually yeah. need it. Uh, and then you've yeah. got still have 
poor areas in Fungaray when you think, well, we gave them five hundred million dollars. Where's it all gone? Yeah. Yeah. And this yeah. and this is this is what antagonizes people. And I think uh, for a while that I was feeling the same way until I understood that <laughs> wait, there's something wrong here. Yeah. You yeah. know yeah. how does how did that twenty million dollars go to nothing? Why yeah. are we still are why are we still needing social workers in our communities? Why are we still having destruction of homes? Why are we still having children yeah. uh, um, committing suicide, we attempting suicide? Yeah. When all this money is all there for provisions. You know, yeah. when all these um, when all these um, outlets are getting all this money to help, so how come they um, we're not seeing the help in the end? And like you said, CEOs get a hundred million, um, what hundred thousand oh, yeah. dollars a year? Oh yeah, yeah, easy, right? easy. You know, so, and so that filtered system really, you know, when you think about it, that puts everything into perspective in terms of how much money is actually given out to the organizations and then when you get little old people like myself you know like oh, i don't get paid yeah so for my um whanau support that i do i i don't get paid for my suicide prevention i'm not paid i'm i'm yeah. not funded i don't get like what what i do get goes back straight back into um doing tattoo cover-ups or doing events or projects or, or taking our rangatahi, our youth out and doing things with them and promoting drug-free world and, you know, anti-bullying. You know, the money that we, we do get, the small amount, you know, that we fundraise, and I must say I have no funding, so we yeah. fundraise. What little bit of money that we do fundraise goes straight back into the community, back to the people. I, I might take um, oh, a pizza here and there, or I might take twenty dollars for petrol. But yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not living in a mansion on the hills, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And it's people like that that get noticed the most, you know, yeah. that aren't being funded, that aren't being paid, but they still continue continue to do the work. And I tell you what, those ones that are in those high positions where they get a lot of money, they frown upon people like me. Oh, of course, because um, because yeah, they're, they're, they're oh, look at that girl over there doing that work, you know, and oh yeah. God, you know, and oh here we go, you know. Well, mate, you know, it, it, as long as it works for my families that I work with, that's all mm. that matters, you know. Yeah. And like I said before, with my suicide prevention, I understand that I can't save everyone. But those that I can save, I will endeavour to do so. Yeah. 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 So. All right. Um, I think we've got three minutes to wrap up. And what, what I usually do on this is to give you the final words. Uh, you know, whoever comes on to have the final words. I mean, we have had a long discussions, you and I. We've almost <laughs> three hours and 20 minutes. And I think it's probably been the, probably the best conversation I have uh, on this topic. Uh, because oh, cool. it, uh, it, I think when people watch this whole thing, they will realize what what the situation is um, from yeah. A to Z. And there's no sort of like leaving anything out and a good understanding of what's going on. And um, hopefully they will watch the entire thing because sometimes um, when you get like we say about tidbits, you don't really understand why someone said what they've said unless you have the en entire um, conversation. So uh, I'll give you a minute uh, to come up um, to – what you're going to say, and then you've got about three, four, as much as you take to have the final words for tonight. For all no of us. worries. Um, so, you know, some of the words that I'm going to leave for you are words that have been given to me or handed down to me from uh, kaitiaki, people that have looked over me and supported me and helped me through the journey and the mahi and why I do what I do. It helps you understand. And so some of the things aren't for, these words aren't for me. They're for you out there. Um, so one of the things is that my father gave to me before he left this world was he said to us, some of our, his final words to us, his children, he said to us, you know, um, listen very carefully to what I have to say to you. I want you to look after your children. Go home and love your husbands, your partners, and stick together as a family and look after one another. And those words I hold very, very closely to me because anybody can take those words away and know exactly what it means. 
take care of your children, love mm-hmm. your partners and your or your husbands and your wives, and stick together as a family. Some of the other words and, and things that my father has there for me, I call them gems. Um, is in order the best thing that you can do for a child for a child, the best thing you can do for a child is to love his mother. Mm. And um, that that really resonated a lot with um, Alfano's that we were going through domestic violence. So for, for some of the dads that were offering violence towards the mums and that, you know, those were the words that I offered to them. Mm. The best thing you can do for anybody's child is to love their mother. And um, that, for me, has resonated with so many of our men. And it's just, when you understand, you understand that all. Mm. Um, Some of the other um, kōrero that, that was left, for me and the work that I've done uh, for our people. To, it's not, this court at all isn't for me. It's for mm. me to share with others out there that may need it. Um, when going through domestic violence and working with families that, uh, that have violence in the home, you, um, and this is more so for the mums, you know, so the corridor about, you know, the best thing you can do for a child is to love their mother is for the father. This corridor was for the mum. And so this corridor was given to the mum at a time where they were going through domestic violence. And it was, you have been here before, you know what to do. And when I was given those words from our healer to give to the family that was going through domestic violence to the mum uh, it made no sense to me but mm. once I gave that corridor to the mother she knew straight away what it meant so those words went for me they mm. were for her for for the mum that was going through it and and you know I, I think about it and, and the way that I see that is she knows what to do when, when you are going through domestic violence and you're having an argument with dad and, you know, you know what you have to do. You've been here before, you mm. know. You don't need to ring 120 other people to tell them what's going on. You've been here before. You know what to do. Mm. And that gives the mana back to the mum and giving it back to her, letting her know that she can, she, she has the ability to be able to work through this. Um, some of the other corridor that has been given that are, are real gems that I, I hold closely. Um, <laughs> this is a funny one, actually, and I, I like this one because this one resonates with me. Your uh, koha, you know, when, when somebody asks you what does koha mean, you know, koha, the best way to be able to explain what koha is is um, your car does not run on puppies and love. And and so that one there is, is something that my dad um, used to say a lot of, you know, and um, and I hold fast to that one because a lot of people do ask, well, what is a koha or what, you know, can you explain what koha means? And it's exactly that, that your car does not run on puppies and love, mm. you know. Um, so, yeah, th- those are words that um, really, really resonate. And, and this one here. So I'll leave you with these words. This, this one here was given to um, out on Facebook by uh, Phil Pikea. And he, is, um, he works for Safe Man, Safe Family. He does the domestic violence. And so um, his call it all was during the COVID-19 pandemic, people, men, we're going up to him and asking him, oh, well, what, what are we going to do, Matua? Oh, my God, you know, the whole world stopped and it, there's a pandemic happening. There's, what are we going to do, Matua? What are we going to do about this? And Phil Pikea turned around and he said, you know what you should do? They go, no, what are we going to do? He said, go home and love your family. Go mm. home and love your wife. Go home and take care of your family. And so, you know, um, those words there resonate with me wherever I go. And I hold 
those final words from my dad and the final words from our healers and from people like Phil Pike, yeah, I, I hold very, very fast and I, I hold them very, very closely to me because those are the things that keep me grounded and humble. Mm. So, yeah, those are words not for me, but for those of you out there that that's going to resonate with. Thank you so much. And, yeah, I mean, a better family, um, safer family, safer community. And uh, yeah. I think we can see one, what, what happens when it doesn't, isn't there. And, um, you know, and, um, and I hope, I mean, I love the work you do. I think children without their parents growing up in some other place isn't good for the child or the child of the child or the child of the child of the child. It creates that disconnection that we talked about last time. When you're yeah. disconnected from your um from your fucker papa, from from your culture, from who you are, your identity, sense mm. of identity and belonging is a huge thing for for everyone, not mm. just our people, but everyone. You know, mm. having that sense of identity and knowing who you are, where you come from, you know, where you mm. come like like I said, I tatai to Natikahu and I tatai mm. to Te, te Rarawa. I'm lucky that I can do that, you know, because yeah. um, it, yeah, it's your ukai po, your roots, mm. you know, awesome. and so. Thank you, thank you for having us. And yeah, long discussion, Thanks. but I tell you, when yeah. it flows, when it flows like that, it's yeah, I just let it. There's, yeah, there's no point um, when you're having a amazing. I mean, this has been a really um, this. I can't. Yeah, this has been great. Uh, so. Thank you for your time. And I know um, it's valuable um, from what I hear this week. You know, I understand and some people won't understand that you've been busy in a very um, unique way. And as, as I say, uh, trying to help people that actually need help. So thank you so much, um, Katrina. Uh, and um, much love to you and for the work you do. Yeah. And thank you for Thank you for the three and a half hours that you spent with me over this, thing, this week. That's the longest anybody's ever spoken to me. And um, thank you so much. And I hope some someone got something out of this. And, of course, it's for our community at large. And hopefully they got something out of it. Thank you so much. Um, love we'll to your family. We'll catch up again. We'll, we'll we catch will. up again in our function. Thank right. you. Thank you. Catch you later. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, guys. That's us for tonight. Um, this has been one of the longest ones, as you saw, we had uh, another hour previously. Thank you for joining me, and it's been a really charm to have, um, yeah, I'm lost for words to how to say thank you enough to Katrina for being with us on this, and hopefully you got a better understanding of what's going on uh, in our community, because sometimes you only get one side, and you see one side in the news, and you only, and that kind of getting one side is going to give you a bit of, uh, you know, what, what is that word? A one-sided view on things. It's very simple. If you only get one, hear one side of the story, you only get one-sided view of things. And that's not a way to be um, around and trying to um, be a, do things in our society. And uh, it's best to have both sides. And sometimes it can be three sides. You know, yours, mine, and hers. So thank you so much for joining us. I, um, I'll see you in the next one. Um, Thank you for watching the narrative once again. And uh, if you're watching this on Facebook, thank you so much. Um, and if you're watching this on, on YouTube, as they say, like, like, subscribe, and share if you want. And um, enjoy. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Kakete